Hey everybody, welcome to today's seminar, Five Tips for Fermenting with Philly Sour. Uh, my name is Molly, I'm Alamont's East Coast uh, representative, and I'm here to introduce our fabulous speakers. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Matthew Farber, who is a professor of biology and director of brewing science at U Sciences in Philly, uh, also my future karaoke partner, um, and as well as Kurt Grinwald from the quality manager from Tide Hands Brewing. So I'm going to let them take it away and I'm going to join back in for question and answers. Uh, if you do have questions, please chat, please put them in the ask the question box uh, below. So Matt, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Molly. Let me try to share my screen here. Folks, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me uh, this morning uh, in, in Philadelphia uh, or wherever you might be from. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to give you a, a bit of an update on Philly Sour. Um, title, my presentation is entitled From the Field, Top Five Tips for Fermenting with Philly Sour. In other words, from the field, Top five tips for fermenting with Philly sour. Got to play with that pH a little bit. You know what I mean? So I always need to start with some acknowledgments. I first want to thank Stephen Mita, uh, who was the undergraduate student who discovered Philly sour in my lab. Uh, Marissa Egan is our brewing manager who has done a lot of great work with pilot fermentations in our lab. And Gabby D. Michelle is a graduate student in my lab who's done a lot of great work characterizing fermentation properties of Philly sour. And this has been an amazing collaborative project uh, with the Lalamon team uh, to get Philly Sour into your hands uh, wherever you are. Uh, Tobias uh, in R&D, Molly has really taken the lead uh, on uh, helping us collaborate with commercial brewers across the world. Uh, Sylvie uh, got us here in the first place, uh, along with the help of uh, Didier and Avi. Uh, Avi has been helping us with continual R&D work uh, as we continue to, to learn a lot of great things uh, to share with you about Philly Sour and how you can improve sour beer production in, in your brewery. Also to thank our commercial uh, partners uh, in particular today, Tired Hands. Uh, I'll introduce Kurt uh, a little bit later, um, but the Tired Hands team has been a lot of fun to work with. So I first just want to introduce a quick background about what is Philly Sour. Philly Sour is a pure culture of a lactic acid producing yeast closely related to Lachancia thermotolerance. This is a yeast that both makes lactic acid and ethanol during primary fermentation. This means that it greatly simplifies sour beer production for you. You would make a wort just like you would make any wort, and then you would ferment a beer just like you would ferment a beer with an ale strain, uh, simply adding Philly sour. This is a yeast strain that is going to make a significant amount of lactic acid during fermentation and also alcohol. So it not only makes a beer, but it makes a sour beer. The yeast does it all, makes lactic acid and ethanol. Because this is a yeast, it enables a, di a diversity of sour styles. It's tolerant to hops. Uh, it works with fruit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about lactose. Uh, you can use secondary strains for fermentation, and I'll mention that a little bit today as well. So it really enables brewers to think creatively about sour styles uh, and what can be done. As I mentioned, this is a naturally occurring uh, unique Lachancia species isolated uh, in Philadelphia uh, out of actually a, a graveyard, which is a beautiful park, not a graveyard, but a beautiful park that happens to be a graveyard right next to our campus at the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. And most importantly, Philly Sour makes a really good beer. Um, it's very flavorful. Uh, it's a the lactic acid gives a really nice, clean citric acidity with notes of stone fruit, red apple and, and peach. And if you're curious to learn a little bit more about the background of Philly Sour, how we find, found it, some basics uh, for fermentation, I, I highly recommend that you check out our webinar that we launched Philly Sour uh, on June 11th of last year of 2020. Um, you can find that on Crowdcast at this, this link, or you can just Google Crowdcast Philly Sour launch. So definitely check that out if this is your first time hearing or, or learning about Philly Sour. I do want to repeat one slide from that presentation, uh, and that is just a basic look at fermentation kinetics of Philly Sour. As I mentioned, this is a yeast strain that you're adding to the fermenter. Uh, you're not specially treating your wort in any way uh, than you would um, during any other type of uh, production. And if we look at uh, the drop in pH, what we see is a quick drop in pH in a matter of two to, to five days. 
um, and we can see the the pH dropping from uh, about uh, 5.2 of the wort, dropping uh, in this particular case uh, the beer down to a, a pH of around 3.4. This is a I should point out a 40 liter pilot brew uh, in our lab, about 85% pilsner, 10% flaked wheat, 5% flaked oat, with a single step mash at 65 and a half degrees Celsius. This is a really great basic recipe if you really want to try to get a feel for Philly Sour's flavor and contributions to a beer, I recommend starting with something like this. And this is a really nice base uh, for you to, to then think creatively about how you might experiment uh, and create a, an innovative style uh, of your own. Regardless, I, I wanna point out that this acid production occurs quickly. Um, this is in our lab scale. This was a little slower. We've seen acid production in commercial brewing uh, as fast as, as two days, um, reaching what I'm calling terminal acidity. Meanwhile, the gravity is falling the whole time, but in my opinion, there is a biphasic fermentation where this fermentation early is lactic acid fermentation, fermentation later is alcoholic fermentation. We don't yet understand the biochemistry of the switch. Nonetheless, uh, the, we have some evidence that this is primarily acid production, this is primarily alcohol production. And so acid production early, alcohol production late. This will play a role in how you might uh, add things like fruit during your process. And I'll come back to this in a, in a few slides. I also want to point out here that Philly Sour is a slower fermenter than most ale strains. You have to consider your ale strains have been selected for fermentation for many, many, many years, right? Philly Sour has been selected for fermentation for only a couple years. So it's not as efficient as uh, your typical brewing strains. It's a little slower. Um, we typically see terminal gravity by uh, 10 days um, in most cases. So I wanted to come at you today with some tips for fermenting uh, and uh, or rather tips for using Philly Sour in the brewery. And again, these are tips that we've learned from our collaborators, uh, from our uh, commercial partners who have worked with us, um, have worked with Molly to send us data about their fermentations. Molly did a lot of work in collaborating uh, and coordinating all these brews and getting them together into a lot of table ta data tables for us to kind of read and, and, and study and analyze uh, so that we can better understand how Philly Sour is performing in your breweries. And so these tips are updates to, to some of the information that we presented in that launching seminar, which I hope will help you make uh, a better sour beer. And, and the first tip that I have for you today is, is ferment warm. Uh, we initially recommended a little bit of a lower fermentation temperature, you know, standard ale temperatures. That's oftentimes what we did in the lab, but what we found uh, is that this uh, Philly sour strain is doing very well at warm temperatures. And we're bumping up our recommendation uh, to from about uh, to about 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. That's uh, about 71 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So warm ferments uh, are do very well by this yeast. A warm ferment is going to help you drive fermentation faster. And we've not perceived any off flavors uh, through these warmer ferments. Uh, we've seen some success with free rise. Uh, of course, you want to pay particular attention to not letting it free rise too hot, obviously. Um, but uh, free rise has, has been perceived uh, very well. Uh, and I've also heard that uh, some of my colleagues in Australia have enjoyed pitching this particularly warm at around 30 degrees Celsius and then letting the temperature fall. Uh, and that seems to be working out very well. I'll be very curious to, to take a much more analytical approach to these temperatures to see how it influences flavor. But again, not perceived any of the noticeable off flavors uh, in ale strains uh, at these warm temperatures. And so standard temperatures are okay. I'll show you some data. Uh, we have lots of ferments that have happened in the 18 to 20 degrees Celsius range, uh, but these tend to be um, a little more uh, at risk for under attenuation or slow fermentation uh, beyond those 10 days. Mm -hmm. 
And so uh, I'll pepper some of my tips with some of the data so you can share it. And it's, of course, difficult to present and, and talk about tables. So I'll only try to draw your attention to the most important things on these tables. And if you really care to stare at these a little bit longer, I highly recommend that you check out the recording. You can pause it and stare at it. And you can certainly reach out to me with any questions you have. Uh, what I wanted to point out uh, in this particular table is, again, the, the temperature range. Um, and so this was a, a selection of some of the brews that, that started to raise our temperatures uh, up to uh, you know 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. And what we found were really great fermentation times of uh, you know 10 to 12 days, um, deep, good attenuation rates, fully sour attenuates in the 65 to uh, to 80 uh, percent range, um, and great acid production. Uh, I'll point out now, and I'll probably point out again. Uh, we have never seen Philly Sour fail to sour on the first pitch. Um, and so a really great acid producing yeast. The second uh, tip that I wanna talk about today uh, is uh, related to pitch rate. This is uh, another slide from my launch presentation, but I, we're starting to understand uh, even more about pitch rate. Uh, and as we presented it, it's very true. Uh, we have a lot of evidence, uh, both from the Lalamon team uh, and my own research lab, that pitch rate affects lactic acid production. And so this is a data table um, created by uh, Tobias and his team, uh, in which we've been recommending one to one and a half grams per liter pitch rate. And if we look at the percent lactic acid that's produced in that pitch rate, you can see it's a bit of a bell curve, where from that one to one and a half grams per liter, that's really where we see the most lactic acid. But what's important to think about here is that uh, this is optimal pitch rates for lactic acid production. Significantly over pitching or significantly under pitching might reduce the acid that's, that's made during fermentation, but it still can make a, a very tasty beer. And so if I go back to that table I just showed you, uh, if we now draw our attention to the pitch rates, what you'll see is that a lot of the pitch rates actually were around that um, uh, 50, well, in this case, a diff slightly different scale, um, 50 grams per hectoliter um, or five grams per liter. You know, you can see we're in that lower range uh, of fermentation, but we still drove nice acidity. Uh, we still had nice fermentation time and temperature. So you can ferment at a half of a gram per liter, but consider if you're really trying to drive acid production, pay attention also to your pitch rate. And of course, I am a scientist. I can't just tell you five things about uh, research that we've been working on. So you know, I had to pepper in a, a tip 2.5, which is related. Uh, and that is that you can propagate with brew house turns. Um, and so one of our collaborators uh, stepped up uh, his Philly Sour by uh, pitching yeast to 11 and a half hectoliters on day one. He did a second brew on day two um, and uh, cast out the wort on top of that original 11 and a half uh, hectoliters, um, leading to a, a really nice beer, 10 days of fermentation with uh, nice acidity um, and decent attenuation. This uh, attenuation is a little lower because uh, he added lactose. So if uh, you have concerns uh, about stepping this up or brewing at a very large scale, uh, you can step it up uh, uh, with brew house turns uh, propagating it in your fermenters. You know, the, we have only so far drawn this out, drawn this out to two step ups. Um, is there a limit? I think the most important thing is that you're catching uh, the yeast early. You're catching it within the, the first 24 hours so that it's still in that lactic acid phase that I was describing in the first few days. Um, you wanna make sure that you capture it there uh, while you're stepping it up. Um, and so, you know, in theory, uh, there might not be, but two is so far the evidence that, that we have to support. Tip three, uh, you know, I have, uh, have to always throw as many puns as I can at you. Um, aren't you grateful for fruit? Go coconuts. Aren't you grateful for fruit? Go nuts. Uh, sours complement fruited beers. Um, the acidity dries, draws out the fruit flavor and character in your beer. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of folks that uh, have, have have found great beers with fruit. Uh, so here's a list of some of the fruits um, that have been added by some of our uh, pilot collaborators: uh, mango, um, aronia berry, pineapple, 
Again, what I love about this is this is a way for you to make a Philly Sour Brew your own, uh, pulling in fruits uh, that are local to you uh, or your brewery. And what I think is interesting to think of, about fruit uh, is that when you add it to your brew is going to introduce a different character. You probably know this from your own brewing experience. If you add it early, it's going to contribute more to alcohol production. If you add it late, you're going to get a little bit more flavor and aroma because you're not driving it at all off through the carbon dioxide uh, gas. The same is going to be true here, but what I like to think again is that point of the lactic to ethanol switch where the first couple days fruit additions will contribute to acidity, later additions will contribute to alcohol. You of course should be thinking about the impact on flavor and aroma throughout the process and where it might be beneficial to add. I also like to recommend adding it mid-fermentation, uh, early to mid-fermentation, because it helps to rouse the yeast. One of the things I won't be talking a lot about today, uh, but I find very fascinating, is that Philly Sour is very flocculent. And so some of the um, uh, plus or minus that we see in attenuation might be attributed to very strong flocculation character. And so a fruit addition in early to, to mid fermentation might help rouse the yeast, um, reactivate them and, and get them reinvigorated, not reactivate, reinvigorated for uh, fermentation to continue. And so um, this type of uh, addition uh, mid to early to mid fermentation, uh, we've not had any reports yet of, of inhibitory extracts on fermentation performance. One of the things that uh, I think you also should consider with your fruits uh, is, is the nature of the carbohydrates. Um, they're depending on the fruit and the ripeness uh, or the age of the fruit, they can have a, a balance of glucose, fructose, and sucrose. And so we don't yet have a, a really great grasp of the role of fructose and sucrose um, on fermentation character, but we do have strong evidence that the addition of glucose to your ferment uh, is going to help drive acid production. And so I talked about this at length in my last presentation. You can add glucose to drive more acid production in your fermentation. Likewise, if you're adding fruit extract, if you add it early, you can also drive more lactic acid production. And tip number four, uh, People then like to add lactose to their brews to help balance out the acidity in the fruit, uh, to kind of blend it all together um, and balance it on the palate. And we are happy to uh, share some data to tell you that Philly Sour does not ferment lactose. Uh, much like most of your ale strains, um, lactose will remain in your brew, contributing to residual sweetness. Have to, of course, remember that if you're adding lactose to your beer, uh, your attenuation is going to go up because your uh, final gravity is going to go up because of the lactose that remains in your brew. Again, you'll see kind of a, a mixture of pitch rates here, a mixture of fermentation temperatures, and a mixture of uh, fermentation times uh, and attenuations, but, but all uh, perceivably tasty beers um, as, as testified by our, our collaborators. And this is some recent data from my student, uh, Gabby, where uh, she did this in triplicate. Uh, she looked at um, added lactose during fermentation at a laboratory scale. So these are 250 milliliter ferments. This is just a control. You can see increasing uh, density um, in degrees Plato as we increase lactose. Uh, this is no lactose, 5% lactose and 15% lactose. This is the fermentation um, of Philly Sour. This is the fermentation of American Ale. Um, and then this is the pH scale. And so this is the American Ale strain. And then this is the Philly Sour strain. And what you can see are some slight differences in fermentation. Um, but if we look at the slopes of these lines, uh, they're not perceivably different. We don't seem to see that much of an effect on rates of fermentation. Um, and certainly we don't seem to see much of an effect on acid production. We also looked at titratable acidity and, and didn't see a significant difference. So lactose does not appear to affect the fermentation uh, kinetics of, of Philly Sour. 
And tip five uh, is that we definitely recommend playing around with Philly Sour to, to create innovative styles uh, in your brewery. And, and one way that you could do that is by adding a second yeast. And so we recommend adding a second yeast strain after primary souring. Let that yeast, let, let Philly Sour drive acid production to about day four, day five, and then add that second strain. Personally, I love Belsaison uh, as, as the second additive to, to make a or mimic a, a sour farmhouse kind of style. But there's also been success uh, drying it out with your standard uh, ale strains, with Kvike strains, with Brett strains. Uh, pick your favorite yeast uh, that you are interested in trying to, to der derive flavor characteristics from that will complement the acidity and flavor of Philly Sour. And, and you can create a lot of interesting beers from, from that approach. It is not recommended that you add the second strain at the same time as Philly Sour. Philly Sour gets outcompeted by traditional brewing strains. And so you will lose all the acid production. You will lose any flavor character by Philly Sour if you are co-pitching with the strain. So again, this is why we recommend adding, adding a second strain after terminal acidity, after day four uh, or day five when that acid has dropped. And of course, I said I can't give you just five tips. Um, so here's a bonus tip. Uh, Philly Sour makes a delightful sour in mead. Uh, we've uh, One of our collaborators threw Philly Sour into uh, some apple juice uh, and into some honey uh, with the addition of some nutrients as per their, their typical uh, production process. Um, and we got really nice attenuation numbers, reasonable fermentation time, and most importantly, a, a tasty beverage. We're still uh, looking into seltzers. Um, Philly Sour is not uh, fermenting as efficiently as, as one would hope, uh, given its preference for glucose in, in acid production. Um, and so uh, I, I'd love to continue the conversation about using Philly Sour for seltzer uh, at a later time. Uh, but for now, we can say with confidence that it makes a, a pretty nice cider need. And so to summarize some Philly Sour fermentation characteristics for you, uh, again, Philly Sour can be pitched just like any other yeast uh, into your wort, into your fermenter to drive uh, acid and alcohol production in the production of sour beer. Lactic acid is produced first. Usually on a commercial scale, we're seeing that terminal acidity in two to three days. Ethanol is produced second with a final attenuation around 10 days. Our attenuation percent uh, is usually around 70 to 85%. Um, any variability in this is likely tied to the strong flocculation character of, of Philly Sour. We're seeing typical beer pHs of uh, 3.2 to 3.5, plus or minus a little bit, with titratable acidities of, of 3 to 8 grams per liter. And remember, I mentioned that you can help drive acid production in at least two ways. You can increase glucose concentrations of the wort. You can also... Uh, pay close attention to your pitch rates, getting up into that one to one and a half grams per liter. Remember too, Philly Sour likes warm temps. So feel free to let this get into the 20s, um, 22 to 27 degrees Celsius. And Philly Sour does not utilize lactose. So feel free to add lactose to your sour beers. And of course, I have to show you some fresh data too. Uh, and so uh, one of my, uh, our, Lalamon's colleagues, um, Glenn Harrison out of Australia, uh, sent us this data very recently. Um, and he pulled a, a base beer from a fermenter, not paying any particular attention to oxygen. So these were samples that were overly oxygenated, um, but then they got bottle conditioned. So again, this is a bottle conditioning experiment pulled straight from a fermenter. Uh, the base beer was 2.8 degrees Play-Doh with an ABV about 4.8% with a, a finishing pH of 4.5. So this was a standard ale. Uh, and what he did was he set up a, a couple experimental uh, versions. He had a control, which was just straight beer, nothing added to it. And then he added Philly Sour at one gram per liter, two grams per liter, four grams per liter, and a half gram per liter with a little bit of dextrose. And what's really interesting then, those, those bottles uh, were held uh, at 15 degrees Celsius for five weeks. And what's really interesting is if you look at this line down here, you can obviously see the changes in color across the experimental uh, variants, but we also see no change in terminal uh, gravity, 
Um, there was still a little bit of residual sugar, even the control fermented a little bit more to, to 1.8 degree Play-Doh, but you can see that the Philly sour samples did not over attenuate any further. Um, and further, they also did not sour any further. Uh, the pH held at around 4.5. So this suggests that Philly sour is not over attenuating beer. It is not producing acid uh, in your product. Uh, and it might protect against uh, oxidation and help promote flavor stability in the long term. Um, Glenn mentioned that there were no perceived uh, off flavors via oxidation um, in these samples, which uh, you can also see in the, the beautiful color that was retained. And so uh, that's what I really was excited to talk to you about today. I'm also super excited to introduce Kurt Grunwald. Uh, Kurt was a former student of mine. He joined uh, U Sciences Brewing Science program back in 2016. Uh, and we had the opportunity to do a really fun event um, with Tired Hands uh, and Jean Brule, uh, where we were talking about the science and, and art of beer. It was an event that we did for a very small group at the Free Library of Philadelphia. We had a blast. Um, Kurt met Jean, and the rest is history. He's now their director of quality uh, at Tired Hands Brewing Company. Um, I've uh, had a lot of fun talking with uh, with Kurt about various aspects of brewing science and coffee science, uh, but most importantly, we've had a lot of fun um, collaborating uh, and discussing uh, Philly Sour. It's my pleasure to introduce him for, to you today to, for him to tell you a little bit about his experience using Philly Sour at Tired Hands. Kurt, thanks for joining us. Uh, and maybe you could just kick things off by telling us a little bit about operations at, at Tired Hands. Uh, thanks, Matt. So we have um, two production facilities. Uh, our main production facility is the Fermenteria, where we have a 20 barrel system. We have um, 18 fermenters total with two lager tanks. Um, we have five bright tanks. We have a, a yeast brink, which has become my best friend over the last three years. Um, we also just installed a centrifuge in the last year, which has been really, really good for our yields and getting more of a consistent product out there. Um, uh, our cafe is kind of in hiatus right now, like kind of up in the air with everything going on. That was our original location where we have a seven barrel system. Um, Gene, our owner and brewer, he still brews over there occasionally. Um, but for now it's kind of shuttered up with just everything going on with the pandemic. Um, our barrelage is right around just under 10,000 a year. Uh, we also have an oak aging facility, which is where I'm coming from today, uh, where we do all of our saisons, uh, and fooders. We have eight fooders currently right now, with a couple bright tanks. We have a bottling line for bottle conditioned beers. And we also have a canning line, which we've been doing can condition saisons uh, in the past year. So that's what our operations look like at Tired Hands. And we also um, have started to dabble in wine, which is something that I never thought I would be getting into when I started brewing here. Uh, but it's been really, really exciting. We're doing some really, really cool things with wine right now. And Matt also alluded to the fact that we have a coffee program here as well. Um, so that's our operations here at Tired Hands. Awesome, Kurt. Um, so I'm just gonna lead the way with some questions for you, I guess. Um, yeah, can you just describe the beers that you know you guys have made with Philly Sour? Yeah, I love those. So the, the first beer that we made was a standard, we call it our cafe IPA. Um, very similar recipe to what Matt described. Um, we did it on the seven barrel system. Um, everything turned out great with that beer. And then we, the last three brews that we've done, one was on the seven barrel system as well. It was a heavily fruited sour. Um, and then the other two were on our 20 barrel production scale facility system at the firm. Um, they were also heavily fruited sours as well. Um, 
The nice thing about these beers is that, like Matt has described in his notes, uh, they've all dropped to terminal, quote unquote, terminal pH uh, within two days. And uh, actually, the last two have dropped under 3.5 in the first day after brewing. Kurt, I think I have that the data oh, you sent go. me here. Yep. So these are the last two that we did at the firm, Ghost 1 and Ghost 2. Um, the one that really, really excites me is that finished pH of Ghost 2 at 3.06. Um, and like this data goes along with what everything Matt said before the fruit additions were done mid fermentation. Um, the attenuation was a little bit lower on Ghost 2, as you can see, but I think that was a more exemplary uh, example of what we see with this yeast strain with that low, low pH. And the nice part about it too is 15 days and 14 days from brew date to package for us. So we're not taking up a lot of time in our tanks. Awesome. Um, yeah, can, with the fruit additions, I mean, you guys use fruit pretty liberally. Um, do you have any like data points that you want to talk about that? Um, like yeah, you know, I, uh, lactic points, stuff like that? Yeah, so yeah. the, I, th I think I pretty much already stepped over that question with that my previous statement, just saying that, uh, the pH drop has been so precipitous with this yeast. Uh, like we, like I said, the first beer was probably the slowest one as far as pH drop. We didn't get to terminal pH until day three or four, but the other three have been right at day two where we've seen the sub 3.5 pH with these beers. Um, uh, the other thing with data that we've seen is <clears throat> temperature control that uh, the second beer that we did over at the cafe, which was our first heavily fruited sour, we allowed that to free rise. Um, unfortunately, that was probably the the beer that under attenuated the most for us. That was a pH, or no, that was a uh, gra starting gravity of 15, and it only got down to 5.5, unfortunately. Um, so temperature control is definitely something that really, really got – in my head after that second brew. Yeah. Kirby, you, I think my, my memory from that brew was uh, it started out low, right? 18, 18 Celsius ish. Yeah. And then can you yeah. comment on the upper limit that it hit? <laughs> so that beer hit the upper limits of 93 degrees. And if anyone out there has ever been to our cafe, you know, our brew system is located in the back of the building. Um, there's, not the greatest insulation. This was done in the middle of the summer uh, during really, really probably our hottest streak of the year here in Philly. And it just, between the fermentation temperature and the environmental temperature, it just got up to 93 degrees. And um, yeah, it's something that I will not let happen again due to the under attenuation that, well, not under attenuation, but the low attenuation numbers that we saw with that beer. But one of the things that I find so interesting about Philly Sour is, is we're not making those off flavors that mm -hmm. a lot of ale strains would suffer from if, if they were getting into those temperatures. You know, we're not we're not getting higher alcohols, uh, for example. I mean, would you agree with that? I would completely agree with that. I, I, I would say like the red apples or red apple flavors are very prevalent in the beginning, but then it really, really mellows out to a really acidic stone fruit like underripe peach is probably the best way I would describe this uh, yeast strain. Um, it, it, I've never gotten anything off. Everything has been really, really sharp acidity wise, uh, never been dull. It's just been really, really, really sharp is the best way I can describe it. Yeah. I mean, you guys have also used this for hoppy beers too. So, I mean, any kind of like advice you have for brewers using the strain, any advice you have for like yeah. Yeah. hoppy brewers, things like that. Yeah. Um, so we only did one beer with it was, the only beer that we was the first, the cafe IPA. And that was showing such beautiful uh -huh. peach notes for us 
that I almost felt like, wow, when do we add peach puree to this beer? It's funny because anytime I feel like we try to do peach beers, they end up tasting like apricot. And anytime we try to do apricot beers, they end up tasting like peach. And like, this was kind of like a awakening moment for me. We're like, all right, well, maybe we can make an IPA that tastes like we added peach puree, but we're just using Philly sour because the peach notes were so strong with us. Matt was here for the day of canning that beer and we were both marveling at both the acidity and just like the strong stone fruit, fruit characteristic of this beer. Yeah, that's actually the beer that I think was in this. That's yeah, that's actually this. Uh, this yes. beer. Yeah. yeah, that was yeah. a delightful beer. And so I think, yeah, brewers have found a lot of success playing with the flavor profile of, of Philly Sour. So again, uh, a little apple early, but that fades. Um, you know, I've heard brewers get really concerned early and say like, this is cider. <laughs> this tastes like cider during fermentation. And it's a red apple that, it, you know, I've not t t characterized yet in terms of what the actual ester is, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasant red apple. But again, that, that to repeat what you said, Kurt, it fades to the background eventually and, and can also, lead to notes of stone fruit and, and peach. And so choosing alternative yeast strains, uh, choosing hops, um, to choosing fruits that complement those flavors, uh, I think can go a long way to, to the stylistic interpretation of, of that sour beer for the brewer. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I got, I'm sorry, Molly. No, no, I got no. really, <laughs> I got really, really strong, like Spanish cider notes early mm. on when we used it. Oh, that's um, so it was like definitely red apple. It was not the green apple that everybody's concerned with. It was, I don't want to, I don't want to say honey crisp, but somewhere in between stamen Y sap and honey crisp. Um, for you, I mean, you guys use this pretty versatility or vers well in many different styles, but also throughout your brew house process. So, uh, do you have any like special cleaning procedures that you guys do? Anything um, that you think brewers should be mindful of? Um, we've just done the standard CIP procedures with this beer and we haven't seen any problems from a micro standpoint or anything else. Uh, one of the nice things about this beer is the shelf stability. So when we first canned this beer, and especially when we can the heavily fruited sours, I made sure I put a couple cans in my incubator just to do a test for my own volition. Even though every beer that we make, we keep refrigerated um, because we sell out of house and we have a couple of accounts now that we sell cans due to the times. But I just like to do it on my own just to see what our shelf stability would be. And with the heavily fruited beers, I was especially concerned, even though we added the fruit like early on in fermentation or mid fermentation. Um, I can say that there was no excessive souring as Matt's notes pre previously stated with the bottle conditioning. Uh, there was no over attenuation. Uh, there was no gushing when I opened the can. And most importantly, there was no exploding in the can, which to me is as a quality manager, that is like the one thing that I'm like yeah. most relieved about when I see a beer that I'm somewhat worried about due to that last ghost that we did ghost number two, uh, we added almost hundred gallons of different berry, oh, berry purees. That was about blackberry, raspberry and blueberry. So that was a little bit in the back of my mind. And I was happy to say that none of that, Pun, pun intended, blew up in my face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, awesome. Um, I think we have some questions um, that we should get to in the comment section. Um, one that has uh, gotten a lot of votes was, does the yeast also sour the wort under pressure? Um, I personally do not recommend uh, fermenting under pressure. I think that's a little bit dangerous, but um, Matt and Kurt, if you guys have any any thoughts about this question, I have not. I know we haven't fermented under pressure. 
with this e screen? We are, nor have we. Um, I've I've heard some anecdotal uh, stories of it being a little more sensitive to pressure than your standard ale strains. So I wouldn't be surprised if its performance isn't as great. Um, but I don't have any data to point to for that. Yeah. Uh, second question: Is rehydration of the yeast pre-pitching necessary? Should you use nutrients with high adjunct, high adjunct wort or ciders? Um, I don't think rehydration is strictly necessary, but it also kind of depends on your uh, on the beer that you're making. If you're, you know, pitching into highly sensitive environment, whether high OG or uh, whatever, then it might be something to consider. Uh, nutrients we're still exploring, uh, but the nutrient data seems promising. I would say, particularly for ciders and mead. Um, yeah, is there anything that you guys want to comment? I know we did not we did not uh, rehydrate the yeast before we pitched it. We just did straight brick into the vessel, and we yeah. did not see any issues with fermentation. Obviously, I'm the academic, so I'm going to tell you to rehydrate your yeast because it's <laughs> best. But you know, we, we I've done some commercial collaborations with Philly Sour, and we pitched it direct, and it's it's always worked. Yeah. So this person has a question. They've experienced lower ABVs when using this yeast, which makes sense if all the glucose is converted to lactic. Currently, we expect 15% of our OG to be converted to lactic due to sugar composition of the wort. Does this match what you have found? Um, so I think a lot of this is really going to depend on your mash temperature and your wort sugar spectrum makeup. Kind of as we were saying before, if you're adding if you're employing a high mash or if you're adding lactose, then kind of expect, you know, a lower attenuation there, but Kurt and Matt. Yeah, you're going to, you're going to definitely um, take away some of the alcohol production. Um, you know, you're shuttling glucose down the lactate uh, pathway as opposed to alcohol. So there's certainly going to be some loss of, of ABV. Um, and so it's worth, uh, if, you know, if you need to pay particular attention to very accurate ABVs for, for labeling purposes, uh, I would certainly recommend careful, more, more careful attention to how you're calculating your ABVs. And it's going to be dependent upon how much lactic acid you make. Yeah. Uh, what about dry hopping and biotransformation on Philly sour fermentation? Ooh, it's a, it's a good research question that we don't have answers to. Yeah. It's definitely something that I want to play with more in our brewery. Um, like I said, we only did one IPA with this E strain. I would love to do more and work with uh, hops that I'm more familiar with. The brew that we did over the cafe, we we're using experimental hops from Australia. So it wasn't really too familiar with their characteristics. I'd love to see what what this yeast would do with like the standard citrus, mosaics, centennials, Columbus, see what kind of biotransformation we can get with that and dry hopping. You also yeah. have to consider that this is a sour beer. And so with the pH going down, the solubility of some of our chemicals uh, might be altering as well. So I wouldn't call it biotransformation per se, uh, but the chemical nature of the beer is going to change just because it is sour. Yeah. Um, a repitching question. Has anyone had success repitching this yeast? If so, did the following fermentations hit target terminal gravity and final pH levels? Um, from... We really, we generally don't recommend repitching this yeast just because it is a lactic acid producing yeast and like best practices, you know, even if you're kettle souring and you're using a bacteria for your kettle sour, uh, anything like that, you're just going to find inconsistencies upon repitch. However, this is kind of why this was, this question drove us to look into that brew house propagation method. And that could be an alternative way if you were looking to extend you know, the, not necessarily the shelf life, but if you're wanting to get um, more uh, production space out of uh, your yeast, it is a method to consider. Um, Kurt and Matt. We have not, we have not repitched this yeast. Uh, we follow guidelines very, uh, very closely. 
because we want to keep Lalamond in business. They've been a good partner for us. Um, yeah. And I want, your, I want your beer. I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to go on record uh, saying that Lalamond is not telling you to repitch it because they want to make more money. Oh, no. <laughs> They're telling you not to repitch it. Uh, because it's very difficult to do consistently to to, yeah. to create a consistent product with a repitch. Think of your ale strains, right? Your neutral yeast. You can over pitch the heck out of your beers, drive a faster fermentation and not get a lot of flavor contribution from the over pitch because you're just trying to re-ferment and you're getting all your flavor from hops or something else. You're getting a lot of flavor from Philly sour ferments. Um, you're especially getting lactic acid fermentation. And if you recall my data where I showed you that bell curve with the acid production at the top, the problem that brewers uh, have with trying to repitch Philly sour is it's very flocculent. It's smaller than Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And yeah. so it's, you have to be very accurate and precise in your repitch rates um, when, you're, when you're going into a subsequent brew. I have some preliminary data, you know, not not ready to sh to, to talk about yet, but uh, you know, I'll just mention it in passing that that Philly Sour's viability is is also less than than most ale strains. Um, its viability drops a, a little faster, I think, in the beer. It could be because of the lower pH, um, and so it's a more stressful environment, and so the yeast isn't healthy for that subsequent brew as well. So that's why we don't recommend repitching it. We have repitched it in our lab with success, um, both in our pilot 40 liter scale, you know, and certainly at, at lab scale. Um, at, as Molly mentioned, the recommendation of doing the propagations in the tank, at least up front, will help you scale it for, for your first fermentation. But um, we're not recommending it for repitch because we don't want you to repitch it and it not sour, uh, you know, and then it's not the beer you wanted it to be. Yeah. And once you, you know, grow things up from lab scale, once you're talking about like 10 barrels or 20 barrels, like you're just talking about different take dynamics at that point. So and that's something we're kind of seeing with some preliminary data coming out of Australia, too, is uh, brewers have done 50 liter uh, ferments and they've been great um, at a lower temperature, like 20, 20 C with a higher pitch rate. But my like concern is once you, you know, put that into a 20 barrel brew house, that might be different, um, you know, with the different convection currents and things like that. So your tank geometry does play a part in your fermentation um, just across the board. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, I know I did yeah. a very rudimentary uh, re-pitch experiment in my lab and just like a one liter flask and I did not get great results with it. I only got a pH drop of about, so my starting wort was about 5.24. I only got it down to around four. Mm -hmm. So not ideal for what we're looking for with this yeast strain. Yeah. Um, but that, the, the brew house propagation technique, it does seem to work and that is a way, you know, that you're able to, I mean, with that technique, you are just splitting your brew house batch size or brewing to multiple, multiple batch fermenters. And the key there is your second ward addition just needs to be added right at the start of the Philly sour growth phase. Um, so that's why we recommend adding that on day two. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, more questions. What about head retention? Do we tend to have better results than sour kettle beer? Yeah, better results. Yeah, we. It, I, it's something I have no data for, but uh, only a lot of experience with in our in our own brew house. Uh, and I've been pleasantly surprised with some of the foam stability that we've gotten out of our Philly sour ferments. Um, of course, it's a foam is a variable, so you, it so much goes into it in terms of your process, the hops you're using. Um, the, the strength of the beer. So it, it, it's I'm not gonna say Philly Sour will give you good foam, but I think compared to traditional souring techniques, uh, there is typically better foam stability. Yeah, that's kind of what we've seen as well. Um, so is, are there references to acidity uh, in TA in addition to just pH? Um, we do have some uh, lab lab data on TA, um, but a lot of the brewers, I think, 
<laughs> getting brewers to measure titratable acidity is not the easiest thing, but we're on the Lalamont side of things, we're working to uh, hopefully make it a little bit more user friendly for brewers to understand what titratable acidity is. But and that's what, what, I, what I hope you've been able to communicate to you guys today is, is that you, you have the tools to alter the acidity. And so, you know, one beer that is a pH of 3.5 could swing in a couple different directions, right? In terms of the, the titratable city that's in there and it would still read a, a 3.5. Yeah. Um, and so again, consider pitch rate, consider glucose additions um, to, to the wort uh, and, and that's gonna help you drive more or less acidity. And so you can make it slightly tart or, or you can make it pretty sour. Yeah. Uh... It looks like the majority of data is based on sessionable IP ABVs. Has anyone experimented with higher ABV sours with this C strain? And what were the results? Um, we do have some data. It is buried in there uh, for starting gravities at 20 Play-Doh, 18 Play-Doh. Um, and those, I believe, I'd have to go back and look uh, to make sure I'm answering that question correctly. But they did finish. Uh, they might have had to have another yeast strain added to them to like make them finish all the way. But I can go back and look. And if you want to uh, shoot me that question via email, I can get that data for you. Um, but yeah, Matt, Kurt, any, have you guys seen anything, anything like that? It's certainly uh, capable of, but like other strains, it gets stressed uh, at those higher gravities. Um, in the lab, we've done propagations. We, we see growth and, and activity at, at least 8% alcohol. Um, so you can get it up there. Uh, and I, like Molly said, uh, it will sour uh, a 20 degree Play-Doh wort, but you might need a, another strain to finish it off. Oh. We've only done beers up to 16 degrees Play-Doh. So we have no data from our brewery which is still fairly high like i mean that's yeah. that's still a fairly you know that's not like a 12 degree play-doh what i would call, consider session 12 or below um brett what about co-fermentation with brett instead of sack uh we do we have seen some breweries add brett not as co-fermentation but as a secondary yeast strain added mid fermentation like we we recommend um, yeah, you can do it. Uh, I don't see any any issue there. Just you know, be mindful that you're adding Brett as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you can brew cider with Philly sour. <laughs> so we're just gonna we're we're kind of closing in on time here. So uh, does Philly sour ferment sucrose? Uh, well, it ferments. It will ferment glucose, but Matt and Kurt, do you guys have specific tips for fermenting sucrose? It will. Um, when I was commenting on my slide uh, with fruit additions, you know, I don't yet have a, a good data to understand whether it's driving lactic or alcohol or how efficiently it's fermenting sucrose, but it, it will definitely ferment sucrose. Yeah. Regarding tired hand practices with Philly, do you aerate your wort before dry pit for uh, pitching and what levels do you target? And if you pitch mid fermentation with fresh liquid culture, do you aerate add oxygen before adding that co-pitch? We haven't <laughs> added co-pitches for our fermentations with Philly Sour. They've strictly been Philly Sour beers. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Oxygenation standard for us is three liters per minute. Yeah. Let's, uh, some of these questions, yeah, some of these questions we've already answered. Uh, any, is there any wort supplementation needs with seltzer production? We're still investigating seltzer production with Philly Sour. Uh, in meat and cider, it seems to be doing okay. Uh, your nutrition is going to be super important there. Um, but with seltzer, we're still diving into that because it looks like the sugar spectrum matrix is, it be obviously it is slightly different from cider and mead, but that uh, it might be even need, need even more um, nutrition. But I know Matt, you guys were looking into this too, right? 
Yeah, the, the fermenters are still going. Yeah. Uh, any studies on hop creep with dry hopping closer or at the end of fermentation? I do not know of any studies. Um, no, we, we haven't looked at this, but you know, a hop creep is hop creep, and, and I think it'll happen uh, regardless. Um, however, uh, the effect of acidity could counteract uh, the enzyme activity that's, you know, the glucoamylase that's responsible for hop creep. So it's an interesting question that I can speculate on, but you know, again, we don't have any hard data um, that su this supports or denies that. Yeah. And what would you recommend to drive up ethyl esters? Um, high OG, no oxygen. I think, um, I mean, yeah, Matt. We, I talked about this in my original presentation and all malt worts tend to be a little bit more apple forward. Um, it's the addition of glucose that tends to lead to a little bit more of the peach. Um, and I think Kurt was describing a little bit more uh, apple too with some of his warmer ferments. So I'd be interested. We haven't played around enough with temperature and sensory, uh, but maybe Kurt, you could talk about uh, your opinions on apple notes. Yeah, I, I definitely think the apple notes were more prevalent when the fermentation temperature was warmer. Um, and as the fermentation obviously was slowing down, the temperature is going to drop in the tank. The one that we allowed to free rise, that is. Um, and we were getting a lot more of the stone fruit towards the end of that. So that's just one brew. Everything else has been controlled, but that's what we got data wise or from a sensory perspective anyway. Yeah. Uh, how heavy can you hop with in your whirlpool with Philly? I want to say pretty heavily, um, as far as I know. Matt and Kurt, do you guys have any? I don't think we have really good data on that, but it, I mean, it's it's not like a bacteria where you know alpha acids can inhibit uh, lactic production. I don't think so. Hop to your heart's content. Yeah. <laughs> about it. Um, there's some questions about the pitch rate calculator that I just want to get to really quick. Uh, yeah, our the pitch rate calculator on our website does recommend, uh, I think it's 50 to 100 grams per hectoliter. Um, this was based on our earlier lab data that we did, and it is something that you could still um, recommend. We still, you can still, you know, pitch towards the 50 grams per hectoliter, depending on your OG, I would just be mindful of your fermentation temp. Um, really bump up your fermentation temp. Like we said before, this is something that is probably more important than your pitch rate at this point. Um, but your whole, the whole point is you want the yeast to remain in active fermentation. Uh, so, you know, consider your mash temperature, consider your original gravity, and then, kind of design, you know, your brew around that, but also be mindful that at um, like between 22 and 30 C, so like for everything in mid seventies is kind of going to be really key. Um, Matt and Kurt, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, we're kind of getting close to time uh, for the questions we didn't answer. Feel free to like email. Uh, I'll put my email down in here in the chat. So and then I can send these out to whoever uh, whoever they're specifically for. Um, but yeah, is there any final thoughts, closing statements that we want to share? Um, Kurt, uh, I do think I asked you to do some homework and uh, <laughs> we, are, we are recent fathers, although not so recent anymore, but uh, time flies. And so I asked Kurt if he could close this out with a, with a dad joke. Yeah, there's one thing that I've learned with having a child is that there's a lot of Velcro in my life. And I'll give everybody this tip. Do not buy anything with Velcro. It is a complete ripoff. Thank you, everybody. That's it. Kurt out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>